for years and years. Uh, you can imagine how utterly addicted I mean, hope is the crack cocaine of the palliative care community, really. You know, yes. every time I speak with you uh, on the phone, you, you're you very up to date on what's going on in the world. And I'm wondering how you stay informed and aware of the destruction and collapse and still keep your heart open. How do you keep yourself inspired, Andrew? First of all, thank you for saying that I am well up on things because I think that's actually a responsibility of our time. So many people... What specific effects of climate change, uh, habitat destruction or human systems collapse are you imagining occurring that would affect you and your loved ones uh, or your community? Hmm. I'm, I mean, in many ways I've been tracking um, habitat shifts throughout my lifetime. Um, just tracking in, in one area of Maine that I've gone to every summer since I was a child, tracking the loss of uh, species in the ocean throughout my lifetime. It's been pretty, pretty radical in the last... And so I, I went know, to fill years. that gap. And this is a long way of, of saying that I think that, that you talking about this culture being suicidal is being desperately safe. important. Yeah. Um, so it's demanding urgent action you know there should be red lights everywhere you know uh, alarms guy that should be going off but it seems um people think it's not happening or it's a joke or it's a fantasy or a delusion i i have no idea but i'm concerned about that yeah and that's uh... Yeah, of course. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to check out. Um, Stephen, thank you again very much. And especially in these kind of uh, uh, dicey times of having lightning and thunder, I can sure appreciate what that is. So, Yeah, it, it's close by, but we'll go ahead and, and it may be something that if we get the sign, we might have to stop more or less immediately. You, okay? Whatever you say goes. Great. Okay. Okay, so right. uh, far farewell to both of you. I'm there at your beck and call if you need be, and have a lovely interview, you y'all. Thank you, Dean. So, Stephen, uh, really, really, really grateful that you can do this with us. Uh, I, I consider us very fortunate that that we can do this together today because I know you're going to be traveling soon. So, thank you. Thank you too. So um, I want to introduce this symposium uh, to you and to all of our viewers. Uh, we are daring all of our guests to open their hearts with us and speak from the place of feeling into their response to our planetary predicament. We're dealing obviously with a huge urgency and we're inviting each guest in this symposium and our audience to go where very few people on this planet are going with the current global catastrophe. So this symposium is designed to assist people who are moving beyond hoping to take their next powerful steps in this journey. It's designed for folks who have explored the topic of societal collapse, abrupt climate change and the effects those things have on our human hearts and life experience. We're asking each guest as a leader to be an example to others by daring to speak their hearts open, to break their hearts open actually in these interviews and share their joys and fears in response to our planetary predicament. We're asking them to be talking hearts as opposed to being talking heads. Using their joys and their fears to explore deeply with us as we discover for ourselves what this unprecedented time is asking of us. Each interview in this symposium will be a different kind of interview than our viewers may anticipate. These interviews are not going to be shallow in that they just offer a bonanza of information. We're calling on each guest to be who they are and share exactly what they're feeling in the present moment about the topics we're addressing. 
we ask each person we interview to speak beyond hope and look deeply at what this unprecedented time is asking of us. So today I'm interviewing Stephen Jenkinson, who is a teacher, author, storyteller, spiritual activist, farmer, and founder of the Orphan Wisdom School, a teaching house and learning house for the skills of deep living and making human culture. It's rooted in knowing history, being claimed by ancestry, and working for a time yet to come. Stephen's work, particularly his work with grief, sets the perfect stage for his present day. You may learn more about his work at www.orphanwisdom.com. Welcome to the symposium, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen, I don't have to tell you that Mother Earth is in terrible trouble, so much so that humans appear to be close to making this planet uninhabitable. What specific effects of climate change, habitat destruction, or human systems collapse are you imagining that would affect you, your loved ones, and your community? And what are you most afraid of, and how does that determine what is important to you? <laughs> a compound question, eh? Yes, I'll be asking you a couple of those. Okay. Well, um... You know, I farm most of the time. So the idea that climate change is a kind of yet, yet to come. Okay, just one second. Sure. You just have to close it. You just have to hang it up and then keep it off the... Okay, so we'll have to start again, unfortunately. Okay. The phone just um, rang this there. All right, so we'll start again. Um, well... I farm most of the time. Uh, when I'm not on the road, um, kind of being troubled aloud, I'm farming. And that means that I have a front row seat on the kind of preliminary stages of what you're asking me about. Yes. And for us here, um, these things are not hypothetical and they're not in the future either. In fact, as we speak right now, there's a kind of a thunderstorm rolling in. And even if, if it were to thunder and lightning, it would, it would ruin our interview right now because we'd have to shut it down but it would be the best thing that happened around here because the water is is getting scarcer all the time and we're in the east where it's not as in the west so if anybody's willing to know what's happening these things are knowable now and um as to you know as to fears i'm not sure that i that i have any to be honest and it's it's not out of um being remote or or sort of artificially reassured but i'm not sure that fear is all that mandatory or useful in a time like this i think more um you know we're we're compelled to be mobilized rather than upset and it's important to make the distinction i think you know you used the word earlier in the introduction which which could use some some scrutiny and some attention right now this moment you use the word catastrophe to describe the circumstances that uh, are that will ensue. Now, yeah, you you have a wonderful definition of that. I'd love to hear more. Yeah, uh, well, this is it's not my definition. It's a kind of if you do a little etymological work from time to time, and I'm lucky enough to have a school wherein I do that constantly, then this will just come riding right up towards you. In this particular case, the word catastrophe has nothing to do with um, destruction uh, of the obvious kind. Uh, it, it comes from this. The prefix uh, comes from the Greek language, uh, ancient Greek, and it's a preposition which answers the question where, and the answer is um, uh, sort of down and in. That's the kind of twin sensibility of the, uh, of the trajectory. So there's some kind of descent, and but there's some kind of entry as well, which means the descent is not for its own sake, but somehow to gain access to something that staying closer to the surface, you wouldn't have the opportunity to do. And the root word, S-T-R-O-P-H-E, this is an ancient, ancient uh, Indo-European word that comes actually from 
from uh, the early technology of weaving of all things. And it refers to something being assembled or, or um, plaited, as they say in England, or braided, as we might say over here. So you put the two things together, and a catastrophe more properly understood is a way that has been somehow prepared or assembled or woven prior to your appearance on the scene. But somehow, without you seeking it, you have both the opportunity and the obligation to descend underneath and beyond what your normal inclinations would be, uh, what, the, what the culture would normally endorse as a kind of sort of physical preoccupation of your life. And by so doing, which is principally a, a kind of solitary pursuit, you enter into some other kind of sort of mystery realm that the normal daylight would, would seem to banish. And the secret news in there is that if there's a path to follow, it means people have been doing this before you. And even though you might be on the path by yourself, the fact that there is a path is the whisper might uh, amount to the real needed companionship in a real troubled time. So you put the whole thing together and you say, well, I would agree with you. We're in a time of catastrophe, which means it's uh, no longer the little prince time. It's no longer a time for soaring and for feeling good and for our addiction to comfort and control and reassurance that uh, the time is already upon us to, um, to proceed as if the time to come may, will have to know that people in our time were willing to pay the price of being alert. And I, I, think, um, I think there are some that are showing the signs, and of course there's lots more who consider this kind of one lifestyle option amongst many. And so good news is there's work to be done. Thank you for that. I couldn't agree more. You know, uh, you obviously are widely known as the grief walker. You <laughs> clearly walk and live with grief and seem amazingly comfortable with it. And in a recent interview, I heard you say that what sanity looks like in the face of our global predicament is grief. Now, many indigenous cultures around the world regularly practice grief rituals or have spe specific procedures in place to help their communities grieve consciously with safety and support. Um, the inhabitants of industrial civilization uh, are grief phobic, as you know, and death phobic. But I noticed that while many people in this are terrified of any talk of conscious grieving and avoid such work like the plague, many others are hungry for it. Would you say more about that and also about your assertion that the best way to find sanity in this culture is to grieve? Well, you know, I, I myself wouldn't characterize the culture as grief phobic because, because that implies that there's some alertness to grief that detonates some kind of fear or avoidance. What I've noticed over the years is something much more akin to what I've come to call grief illiteracy instead. And, and uh, the reason I chose that word to characterize it is grieving is something that needs to be learned. Uh, and, and this means you need teachers. Well, well, the best grief teachers are grief practitioners, not grief counselors. Yes. Okay, the idea being that grief counselor's job principally is to contain this kind of unsought wisdom that grief somehow prompts, whereas grief practitioners somehow become the incarnation of what they're advocating simply by being maybe uncommonly vulnerable to the, to the nuance and to the torments of the times. So it is a kind of, uh, it's a kind of, kind of, soul attuneness, I think, what grief is. And it's, I've taken lately to saying, listen, if you don't have a kind of broad spectrum anxiety, you don't get it. And, and, and it's not a user-friendly proposition any longer, right? It's not, it's not something that, that will pass with time once you get used to it. That's called amnesia. Mm -hmm. grief, grief is kind of the antidote, really, 
to depression and despair. Yes. Depression and despair are fundamentally those, those inclinations that, that just refuse the dissent. And ironically, by refusing the, the kind of informed dissent that grief is, you have a kind of, a kind of pitched forwardness into what you know not that, that prompts all kinds of shutdown. And it seems to me that's more what the depression and despair is. You know, as to, I think you used the word hope earlier too, and maybe I could say something about that now. Sure. I worked in the death trade for years and years. Uh, you can imagine how utterly addicted, I mean, hope is the crack cocaine of the palliative care community, really. Yes. And, and it's widely trafficked in and it's widely dispersed and distributed. But nobody seems to wonder about the consequences of being hopeful when something's going down. And um, it's, just, it's just a question of what are you hoping for? Uh, that's what they focus on. Well, I started to wonder what does it do to be hopeful uh, uh, when, you're, when you happen to be dying? What do you, what is it, what's the hoped for consequence of being hopeful? And uh, you realize that hope is, is much more akin to being mortgaged than it is to be positive. And, you know, many people listening right now know what a mortgage is and what it does to you. And it and obliges you principally to set aside your willingness to live in the present moment, you know, and do without, so-called, for the sake of some future uh, possibility, which may, but much more likely will not, you know, come to hand. So, so hopeful people, by definition, tend to be hostile to the present in favor of the future. Whereas... Grief, grief besotted people, of which I guess I'm one, uh, tend to be very much citizens of the present moment and don't require a future in order to be able to make a move now any more than they require the permission of people who are refusing grief as a precondition to grieving themselves. And so the film, the, the National Film Board of Canada film was called Grief Walker, but I probably am more inclined to think of myself as a grief monger instead. Whereas I'm kind of selling this strange elixir of alertness and sorrow, you know, going door to door. And the takers have been few, uh, but, the, um, but the willingness when I do find them is really substantial. So would you then say more about how this is where we find sanity in the culture? Well, it's obviously it's an uncommon understanding of sanity. Right. I mean, let's use the word health maybe because it's, a, it's slightly broader. Mm -hmm. um, I, I used to oblige dying people all the time to die healthy. And in a in a culture that really doesn't understand what health is, that, that phrase makes no sense at all. So, so what, does, what does your personal health derive from? Currently, the idea is that it derives from an absence of disease. But, um, but this is an absolutely impoverished understanding. I think it comes closer to something like this. Health is a consequence of your lived relationship, first of all, with all other human beings. Second of all, your lived relationship with everything in the world that's not human. And thirdly, your lived relationship with everything that we could call for the moment the unseen world, the mysterious world, you know, and so, and so on. You put those three things together, you have a tripod. And that's what your personal life hangs from, like a cooking pot. And the food inside the cooking pot is your health, your sanity, and your capacity to act accordingly. So it seems like kind of an elaborate air, a very indirect, but in truth, it's, it's what lends each of us our capacity to proceed really in the teeth of which that would, would seduce us to stop and to, uh, to hesitate, to despair and all the rest. So, so I, I think, um, as I said earlier, grief is the antidote to, to uh, depression and health is not the absence of disease. It's your capacity to proceed in the presence of everything that seduces you away from health, away from alertness, 
away from from being willing to be a citizen of the present moment, even though you wish you had been born into a more promising time. But maybe, maybe with this realization, we have a, a kind of other willingness to proceed as if a troubled time like this would appear to need us. And this is why we've been born into it. Thank you so much for that. Uh, you know, in, in my work, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I use a great deal is poetry because it tends to take us out of the linear way of being and more into the heart way of being. So um, it just comes to me to share a poem by Denise Levertov called Talking to Grief. I'd just like to read this short poem. All right. Ah, grief. I should not treat you like a homeless dog who comes to the back door for a crust, for meatless bone. I should trust you. I should coax you into the house and give you your own corner, a worn mat to lie on, your own water dish. You think I don't know you've been living under my porch? You long for your real place to be readied before winter comes. You need aim, your collar and tag. You need the right to warn off intruders, to consider my house your own, and me your person, and yourself my own dog. Mm -hmm. I get the tone, you know, but I, I would have kind of preferred something along the order of grief as a kind of honored guest. But I suppose that, that not being allowed in the front door, it could do a good job of imitating a dog at the back door instead. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, grief is at all of our doors, whether we realize it or not. Now, Stephen, you've also stated that the current global crisis is asking something of humanity at this time. From your perspective, what is being asked of humanity in this crisis? Well, to be human. And uh, that's not as evident thing that it might assume. Uh, by virtue of being born looking like you and I do, this is not a, uh, this doesn't make our humanity inevitable. Uh, I, think, I think the inevitability of being human is one of the trances, one of the spells that modernity has been walking inside of for an awful long time now. And it's about time we broke it. And, uh, and it's not likely to happen, mainly because on the surface of it, the idea that humans are, are crafted, not born, sounds strangely elitist or even dangerous. But, you know, the truth is that virtually every indigenous culture on the planet practices human making ceremony uh, at puberty and, and at other places because they understand that humanity is not a given at all. And, and the consequence of the, the world around you for our failure to craft humans out of, um, out of those of us who were born, I mean, the, the kind of default situation is, is this enormous centrality that we put ourselves into the middle of. What are they calling our era now? I've heard this recently. They're calling it the Anthropocene era. Right. Now, the cruel irony of that is the more we insist that humans are the center of the era we find ourselves in, the poorer we become, the more ravaged the world around us becomes. We, we don't simply do a good job of being the center of anything, creation or God's plan or any of that stuff. So, um, so it's, it's time to take a junior position, you know, in the scheme of things, uh, to stop reading the owner's manual for the universe and trade it in for a kind of, uh, you know, a, a minor kind of, you know, 88 page book that wonders how did things come this way? rather than how can we technolog technologically, you know, stick handle our way out of it one more time. I'd like to uh, um, mention to you that I was interviewed not that long ago by two young men on the radio. And uh, they called themselves, um, uh, oh, I've, I've forgotten the name right now, but it was ecological in their orientation. And somewhere in there, they asked me, 
uh, they said to me, you know, they're working on a serum. It's going to sound like science fiction to you, but the serum is, if you take it, you won't have to die. My question to you is, if I take the serum, he says, when, when it becomes available and it's my turn, what will I miss? Yes, another, this is an unbelievably achieved question for a young person to wonder what will they miss by mm -hmm. not dying. Yes. And my, my response tried to keep pace with that brilliance. And I said, you know, I really don't think the question is, what will you miss if you don't die? I think the question much more urgently is, what will the rest of us miss if you don't die? Okay, the reason I mention this to you is because there's, there is kind of, there's species death, and there's the death of, of a certain dream of a kind of human-inspired better day that's happening kind of as I'm sitting here. And I, and I see the casualties of this, of this death all around me. Most of the casualties are resisting the fact of it, the truth of it, the necessity, and yes, probably the permanence of it. And that resistance, it, it, it's a terrible thing because it, it seems to seduce people back towards how they feel, how it's working for them. So the reason I answered these young men was to say, you know, without these kind of deaths, which are kind of sentinel events in, in bringing this alertness forward, without those, we have no reason to awake. And, and the Hallelujah Qu Choir will continue singing. Whereas if we awake to the, to the requirements of the time we find ourselves in, surely the sound of awakening will be closer to a sob than it will be to hallelujah. Mm. And I think in our time, a sob is a more reliable, more trustworthy sound that an achieved human being can make, which is to say a willingness not to be the center of the story any longer. Last thing I'd say about it is there's a lot of self-hatred that's running through the the quote, catastrophe communities, the extinction, extinction communities, um, mm -hmm. a lot of ecological movements are animated by this misanthropy and this self-hatred. Yeah. Let, let us consider the real possibility now that self-hatred is not only not called for, but it's actually uh, the same kind of self-absorption you've been engaged in for I don't know how many centuries now. It's another iteration of our self-absorption. Mm. Grief is a way of not obliging us to hate ourselves or each other or our ancestors or our heirs as a consequence of what we realize that has been done in our name. That's why I'm advocating it. I love that. Thank you so much for that. Um, the next question I want to ask you is another one of those multi-layered ones. I know that you're a farmer, among other things, and I know you're very connected with the earth. I also know that you know what is happening to the earth because you're so intimately connected with it. Uh, you, you listen less to the news and more to the sounds of nature. So I'm wondering how you stay connected with the earth, with the sacred within yourself and with other living beings and still keep your heart open. How do you hold the paradox things are falling tragically apart while at the same time there's so much beauty and joy to be experienced and i'm also wondering if there are specific practices that you would offer others to help them keep their hearts open well you know how does it heart open but by breaking yes. i mean I'm, I'm not sure what other arrangement there could be just architecturally you know, as you can see, it's getting darker by the minute here. I, I might look like I'm suddenly in the middle of the night because the thunderstorm has this. So, um, Stephen, I don't know if you can still hear us, but you've frozen just as you were describing your situation. Um, I 
Carolyn, can you hear me okay? I can hear you just fine, yeah. Okay, great. I think we lost him. Mm -hmm. It sure is going great. I think so. Mm. Okay. I'm wondering if I might just give him another call. Maybe that's the way. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> Hi there, this is Dean Walker. Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, it's possible, you know, um, uh, Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, um, I think that the two biggest options are that we pause and see if a better time in the very, very near future might work out. And there's also a possibility, I don't know if you saw in those emails that I sent you, the invitations, that there's a, a telephone call-in option down toward the bottom. Um, oh, that's right. You, so, so you can't call it up on your screen for an old email. Okay, got it. I got it. Um, sure, let me see if I can look that up for you. Okay. Yeah. I understand. I get it. I get it. Um, okay. Well, Car Carolyn is... Yeah, uh, no, she's she's just fine. She's hearing my end of the conversation over here, and yep. so, uh, we're, we'll... oh, good, 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 yay! <laughs> okay, I'm just about there. I'm trying to. Okay, you ready? I'm ready. So um, I've got a, a number, a telephone number that you would call. And I'm sorry, I haven't done it exactly. So I don't know what you'll encounter, but it should ask you for a meeting ID number, which you would just pop in and then that should connect you up with us. So the phone number is um, Six four six five five eight eight six five six, and the meeting ID number is two two seven one five five nine five six, and I. I believe what'll happen is you'll get the same sort of bing bong door, doorbell sound 
and just with audio only, you'll be back in, in the call. Congratulations on the rain. <laughs> okay. All right. Th thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Carolyn, did you follow that? Um, I'm assuming he's going to call in and uh, we're going to do the rest by audio. Yep. Okay. All righty. So. Yeah, we it they it'll just take as long as it takes them to get on the phone and tap those things in. Right. And uh I'm sure we can make it work uh to just do it'll be all you. <laughs> <laughs> so All right. Well, we've got a good solid 20, 25 minutes. And, we uh, do. And you both have covered a lot of ground. So I don't feel at some big deficit at the moment. Um, of course. Oh, there you go. Hello, Dean and Carolyn. Well, hello yes. there. Hi, this is Natalie. Hi. I've I've been able to uh, dial in and uh, and I have Stephen uh, coming to the telephone right now. Wonderful. Shall we continue with the conversation? Do you think it'll work this way? I absolutely will we'll work and thank you so much for being your flexible self. Oh, this is wonderful. I'm glad that this is working. That's great. He, here he is. Okay. And, and I get the pleasure of overhearing the conversation. Now, unfortunately, only I'll, I'll, I'll have to guess what the questions were. <laughs> oh boy, it's quite an interview. <laughs> yeah, well, let's start over with the question I was going to ask you. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. Okay. So uh, what I was asking you is, uh, I know that you're a farmer, among other things, and I know that you're very connected with the earth. I also know that you know what's happening with the earth because you are so intimately connected with it. And uh, I know that you listen less to the news and more to the sounds of nature. So I'm wondering how you stay connected with the earth with the sacred within yourself and with other living beings and still keep your heart open and also how do you hold the paradox that things are falling tragically apart while at the same time there's still so much beauty and joy to be experienced and I'm, I'm guessing that there are specific practices that you would offer others to help them keep their hearts open mm -hmm. well I think the first thing is I, I would never lead. I wouldn't recommend to anybody, quote, open heartedness as a, a kind of general approach to things. Um, because there can be a lot of, I mean, lethal things can ensue. Yeah, it's a, we're, we're, I'm talking about some combination of uh, of alertness, discretion and uh, and a proneness to things instead. Well, here on the in this uh, you know farming operation, we have a lot to do with seeds. You know, almost all through the year. If you look at them pretty carefully, you can see that most of them are shaped similarly, and all of them seem to have this figure, um, uh, at least around half of it, and that seed opens along that fissure almost without fail. I mean, if it opens at all, that's where it opens, which which is to say that. Everything that's seed shaped seems to have this crease in it that's whose purpose is to break, to be torn open right there. And uh, lo and behold, the human heart bears more than a passing resemblance to a seed. Yes. So what's to be said? Uh, obviously, the human heart is being a seed like thing has the same propensity 
or we could not the same vulnerability, the same strength, the same capacity, the same, you know, proneness to life. Thank God it does. So um, what I'm talking about is more something akin to brokenness than it is mm-hmm. to open heartedness. And, and um, you, you know, you don't go seeking broken heartedness. It's, it's a consequence really of, um, of being a not completely uh, lost to your present moment. Uh, I was saying, you know, in our earlier question, something in the, in the manner of, you know, the sound of awakening in a time like ours must surely be a sob. So that's kind of broken heartedness audibly uh, appearing. So that, that's the practice, actually. The practice is to, to learn broken heartedness. Imagine it as a skill, the proper antidote to the kind of competence addiction that characterizes the time, certainly, that I was born into. Um, mm-hmm. And then as a, um, you know, I really am, I'm loath to make any recommendation to anybody else. I'm not sure that I'm working out, you know, fabulously myself. So, uh, you know, a lot of humility to go along with broken heartedness is a pretty good combination. But um, it, there's, I'm not talking about trust. You know, I'm not talking about a naive kind of belief that somehow secretly everything's working out. If anything, you could say that if the last three or 400 years is any indication, if things are working out for the world, then they would tend not to work out for us. We've kind of put ourselves in a kind of um, kind of oppositional relationship to everything that has actually sustained us more or less from the beginning of our appearance on the scene. And to, to the extent that even our own dying is less and less sort of naturally occurring event, more and more hostile to the place that they end up putting us in the ground. So, so yeah, you know, brokenheartedness is a sign that you get it. It's not a sign that somehow it's just too much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, and, and let's talk about death because there's a wonderful video on your website at orphanwisdom.com entitled The Meaning of Death. And I know that you spent many years working in palliative care. You call it the death trade. And you yeah. bring that experience to your current work in the world. You have a lot of experience in being present with people when they die. So yeah. would you tell us more about the meaning of death and why we need to be talking about death now, perhaps more than ever? Hmm. Well, the first thing is that death doesn't inherently mean anything at all among humans. Um, that the, the meaning of dying is a kind of consequence of the kind of life that's been lived prior to it. And, you know, my way of saying it for years has been, I never saw a terminal diagnosis turn anyone into a spiritual genius. And honestly, there's an awful lot of people that are in in a covert way, at least are counting on that very thing that somehow they'll be brought to attention when they glimpse the end of their lives. And, and the best part of them will come forward, you know, something like, um, uh, retirement, I suppose. Well, the truth is, in retirement, if you haven't written a novel before you retired, the likelihood that you're going to write one afterwards is not great. And by the same token, if if you're waiting for the best part of you to emerge, you know, the the genius to emerge, the the real, you know, community focused compassion and so on, until you know you get to a certain age in life, the truth is you've got no practice at it. You have no skill to to bring to it, and so. I saw the same thing uh, amongst dying people constantly. That's one. Two, if you look at how we understand, if you can call it understanding, um, what our lived relationship is with, is with dead people. Um, and now, this immediately sounds like board stuff, you know, and, and your, your, your credibility takes a hit as soon as you talk about dead people in the present tense. But, but I'm, going to will, I'm going to take a chance and do so and suggest to you that when you listen carefully to people's <clears throat> understanding of who the dead are, um, one of the things, they're, they're chronically missing. They're chronically gone. The, the adjective that's used uh, all the time to characterize someone who's died is lost. 
we literally say, I lost my father last month and so on. If you think about the meaning of the word lost actually is, it has nothing to do with dying. It's not a synonym for that. Lost means you've set aside <clears throat> someone, you have no memory of why or how or where you did so, and you have no recourse. That's what lost means. And in truth, we do that with people who die on us all the time. We lose them. It's simply not inevitable. So unfortunately among us, dying means disappearing. Can it be otherwise? Well, it must be otherwise. This is, this is what I would claim. And, and one of the ways to do it is to begin to learn dying. Uh, I had a book come out in the springtime. It's called Die Wise, a manifesto for sanity and soul. And it's been introduced, you know, I've done some interviews and so on, and it's been introduced in the interview as dying wise. It's not called dying wise for a reason. If I were to call it that, what I'm saying is no matter how you've lived up until now, <clears throat> you have this magic ability to suddenly turn the corner on wisdom and bring this unvisited wisdom suddenly to bear on how you die so that the word wisely refers to your dying. But I called the book Die Wise for a reason. It means that the chances of you dying differently than how you lived aren't that good. So die wise means, you know, pursue wisdom, pursue learning without benefit of a terminal diagnosis. And then imagine that when the terminal diagnosis comes to call, then what you have been able to learn before now will be available to you and to those around you. And upon your dying, the story of how you did so suddenly becomes something like a, an unsuspected gem or treasure for people who didn't even know you, but hear the story of how you did it. At least that much is at stake in how each one of us dies. All the bad deaths I saw without exception were small, inward turning, individual, particular, um, private, uh, and so on. Every good death I saw, which wasn't that many, was um, outward turning, sort of in, kind of inadvertently, it, it was a village making event, as it must be, because it doesn't belong to you. The consequences don't belong to you. And, and in fact, the dying don't belong to you, doesn't belong to you either. That's my way of saying we, are, we participate in what dying means by the manner of which we die. And, and we're as much the creator, co-creators of the meaning of dying as we are heirs to any meaning. And the meanings that's available to us right now is a grim, grim charade indeed. Something has to be done about it. That's what I've been doing probably for the last 10 or 15 years. Thank you so much for that. And I have one last question. Yeah. Uh, in this symposium, Stephen, we're, we're moving beyond the cultural fantasy of hope into what we call inspired living and leadership. What wisdom do you have to offer us about how we can live inspired lives and what must we be at this point in human history? Hmm. Well, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take issue with the idea of leadership, at least as it's, as it's currently understood in practice. I'm not sure it's doing any of us any good. Uh, I used the phrase earlier uh, to, to offer a sane alternative to the therapy milieu then that it basically ensnares us now. I offered the idea that we could be and must be practitioners of something that we're advocating rather than teachers of it. And that's what I would say about the idea of leadership that, that um, I don't think the arrangement, is, I don't think it works well for the whole thing to break down into leaders and well, what are the rest of the people called? Uh, what followers or no, it's not a good, I mean, we've tried that. There's another way of saying it. Does everybody become a leader as a result? No, no, we don't. We, we re hopefully we realize that it's, it's a practice of a kind of radical, heartbroken uh, wisdom that's willing to volunteer for duty uh, without any certainty um, that you'll be employed or welcomed or, or that anything you offer will be made use of. And there's an old uh, kind of half-joking phrase that's used all the time. 
sometimes it's better ask to for, it's better to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission right. which means sometimes you have to act without any indication that there's any desire for anyone uh, to see you what you're about what you're trying to do in that sense you kind of become a little bit self-appointed in a dangerous time and an endangered time like the one I find myself in it seems that a certain amount of nerviness in that regard is important but I'm, I don't conceive it of it as as leadership I conceive it of it something like this we have gone several generations now leading with our needs um, the idea that the world is here to get our needs met that human relationships are there for the same reason and um, well here we are we're in the circumstances that we're in uh, as if the world were here for us as well mm. and I would say at this point be we needy or be we not and clearly we are but but some other story has to begin to be told and that is to be willing to proceed as if we're needed with precious little evidence or inclination or, or indication that we are and that takes some well you just have to decide that in a troubled time like we're in that you that you pursue a kind of um, wisdom that basically doesn't look like wisdom any longer I'll give you a little example I was asked at a, some screening of the grief walker film years ago somebody challenged me and they said what gives you the right to be so direct with people who are dying? And my response is to say, well, what gives you the right to be so indirect with people who are dying? Mm -hmm. uh, as if being direct and candid somehow has to be justified, whereas being, uh, you know, covert and, and uh, half-spoken and, uh, and the rest is somehow the default courtesy and, and compassion of our time. I don't think it's compassionate at all. Just take that idea of an individual dying and what I said about it, apply it to the idea that there's aspects of the world that are dying now. And what the question is, what does this ask of us? Not what can we get out of it? How can we survive it? How can we quote rebuild afterwards? So um, I, I think uh, the, the trouble of the time sets the tone and the tone must be to live understanding that you've been given to a troubled time and and the question always must be so what then does this ask of not what can you do uh to to make sure it doesn't get too close to you and it sounds stephen like you are really asking us to be broken-hearted practitioners of grief developing that skill and that that is one of the main things that's being asked of us well, I suppose that's right. You know, um, um, you know, you you came up with a bit of poetry earlier. Maybe I could respond in kind. This is a longer one. Uh, do we have time for a longer one? Sure, please, by all means. All right. Well, this is this is a genius observation. It's um, it's uh, it was written. The lyrics were written by a patron saint of my school. Now he doesn't know that he is, but I've <laughs> nominated him as that, and he's been that for years now, and he's doing a very good job though he doesn't know it. And, this, and I'm sure you know him. It's a countryman of mine named Leonard Cohen. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so he's written a song uh, called Under Leaving. Uh, and I'm going to uh, give it to you in a moment. But um, at first blush, it sounds like it's a love song about brokenheartedness. Listen to it in another way. It's, I think, very clearly a song uh, that's sung in the in the new absence of what you had grown accustomed to and and so it's a song also about dying and if our you know if some aspects of of human culture or at least western human culture is on the verge of doing that very thing the question becomes then what's asked of us and i think this lyric begins to whisper the possibilities and it goes like this he says suddenly the night has grown colder the God of love preparing to depart. Alexandra hoisted on his shoulder. They slip between the sentries of the heart, which is a way of saying, ready or not, it is already happening. The next verse is, 
Upheld by the simplicities of pleasure, they gain the light, they formlessly entwine. And radiant beyond your widest measure, they fall among the voices and the wine. And my understanding of that would be something like the consequence of what you've grown to love so dearly and love itself, both of them depart from time to time in your life and their departure takes place in the context of your ordinary life. There's nothing spectacular. There's nothing off the charts. It's in the ordinariness of your days that these things occur. Next verse. It's not a trick. Your sense is all deceiving. A fitful dream the morning will exhaust. And here's the crucial line to me. He says, say goodbye to Alexandra leaving. Then say goodbye to Alexandra lost. Those last two lines to me say something like this. Yes, you have to learn um, the departure of what you hold dear. There's no question. And we're in a time where we're going to have to learn this seriously, urgently, and very presently. But for all of that, Cohen also says, you have to learn to say goodbye to something leaving that you wish were not. And then you have to be willing to say goodbye to your insistence that all is gone forever, which is what he means, I think, when he says, say goodbye to Alexandra, lost. That hmm. means this idea of lost is the compound fracture of your imagination. It is not the truth. There is no losing in that sense there is simply the nurture of things in a timely fashion uh, and the shortness of your lifespan means you don't get to see them again in your lifetime but the idea that they're lost you know somehow forever this is uh, overstating things enormously i know there's people listening right now are going to say wait a minute extensions extinctions forever but let's be let's be you know humble and realize extinction has been going on as long as there's been life on this planet. I'm, that's not a, a recipe for us saying, ah, this is okay. This is just another turn of the wheel. No, 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 because we're on the crafting end of many extinctions now, and that's probably a first. But, but the idea that we lose what passes from view is probably where the real lostness is to be found. And his, his lyric is saying, no, no, no. Lost is gets you off the meat hook of sorrow, you see. In fact, if you realize, like the light of a star that's already gone out, it's still coming towards you. It still lights you in the middle of the night. And the people who've been before you have a similar function. And the other life forms have a similar function. And someday, not too distant from now, you'll join them. How do you propose to be present then when, you, when you're operating with a, with a kind of canticle of lostness uh, as a way of making sure you don't have to understand these things? So there's enormous consequence to the collapse of our imagination in this regard. And I think the idea of grief actually revives the imagination rather than shuts it down. <laughs> On that beautiful and powerful note, Stephen, we will end our, our conversation. And I want to thank you so much for this incredibly rich time with you. And thank you, viewers, for joining us in and savoring Stephen's deep wisdom. Thank you, too. All right. Well, believe it or not, but it has just stopped raining. <laughs> wow, I love it. <laughs> you know, the whole time I was talking to you, it was it was absolutely howling just outside the door, like three feet away from where I'm sitting right now. And as mm. you know, we had to shut everything down. I'm operating on this with this little light that's not plugged in uh, to be able to, to read to you from that Leonard Cohen book. And as soon as you were starting to say goodbye and thank you, the whole thing has stopped. And it's just coming down downspout now, but there's no more rain. And all I can tell you is, thank God, even though we had that ridiculous kind of 
a disturbance to our technical arrangement, the land around here is sighing this immense relief that for the moment at least, this in kind. And uh, I think that's the proper way to understand everything we were just talking about. That, you know, kindness doesn't always look like what's working out for me. Exactly. And I'm thrilled that we got to be part of that. Well, me too. Stephen, this is Dean again. I, I am just absolutely delighted that we've had this time with you. I so thank you for all that you brought us. And it sounds so exciting. And I imagine it might be also a little bit of dread looking at all the time you have on the road ahead of you. I hope that your sessions with people go very, very well. I'll be looking to see if there's a way to come and see you uh, in, in my area, which is Southern Oregon. And mm -hmm. uh, again, just thank you so much for all that you do and uh, all that you are. And just a, a pleasure to, to spend time with you. Well, let me, let me thank the two of you also, because you might imagine that with what I have to say about there's not a lot of takers, the truth be told. Yes, I get out there. and But, you know, it's one thing to get out there. It's another thing to be considered. And the consideration is as at a low ebb because this stuff's fundamentally unwelcome. So when somebody comes for real and wants to really wonder aloud about these things and devote airtime or, or print or whatever, just to the consideration, not to the agreement, not to yes or no and all the rancor of that, but just yeah. just wondering about it, you know, it does raise up in me the rumor that maybe what I've been trying to be on about for so long might have some nominal use from time to time. And um, I'm willing to proceed uh, occasionally as if that's so based on things happening like the last hour. So I really appreciate it too. Well, thanks, Stephen. I totally relate to what you're saying because that's how I've been feeling about my work now for about 10 years. And there aren't a lot of takers. And when there are, you know, your heart rejoices in willingness to hear. Mm, that's true. That's true, yeah. Bless you so much. And may it be a wonderful time on the road. Thank you very much. I hope so. And before that, I'm going to go out and play in the rain right now. Do All it. Right. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Take care. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.